Thank you, Greg. All right, so I am here to go over some of your frequently asked questions on standards. Greg, you can go to that, there we go. Um, so just so everybody knows, as the standards board, we go through our frequently asked questions periodically, and we just look at the answers and interpretations that have been provided and make sure that they are still current and up to date. We don't wanna have information out there that we are sharing with our members that um, is maybe no longer relevant or has changed. Obviously, COVID-19 has been a huge thing and I think we've seen a lot of questions come up and has made us think about um, how maybe some of these frequently asked questions, answers and interpretations need to be updated to make sure that they are fitting how our standards are currently applied. So, the goal for today, after we go through a couple of these frequently asked questions, is to help you guys gain a better understanding of NACPA professional standards. I'm going to go through two specific frequently asked questions that the standards board has addressed and that have been approved by EAB to be put out on the website. Um, so you should be able to answer those two common questions and interpret them. Uh, correctly apply the standards to your practice. And then I have a link in here to the standards frequently asked questions library. You'll see the questions, the answers, and the interpretations out there. And those are all, I believe, all of the questions that the standards board has looked at and that the executive advisory board has approved already. That's what you'll see out on that website. And then the NACPA professional standards just in general. So everybody kind of it's starting from the same level and has all the standards, just in case you need those for reference. Next slide, please. So the first question that I'm gonna go over involves safe harbor when performing a calculation. Um, before I get into the question, I just kind of wanna level set here with everybody and make sure that everybody understands what a calculation of value is, or this question will be maybe a little bit confusing. So for a calculation of value is when a client and a member, a NACFA member, agree to specific valuation approaches and methods and the extent of the procedures results in a calculated value. So that's in general what we're discussing when we're talking about a calculation of value. The question here was, in a litigation setting, does a member's election to perform a calculation provide a safe harbor, allowing a member not to take responsibility for the appropriateness of the agreed approaches, methods, and selected procedures, or use professional judgment? The answer is no. No safe harbor exists that would allow a member to ignore professional judgment or disregard approaches and or methods outside of the agreed approaches, methods, and selected procedures that best indicate value. Um, all right, next slide. So here's our interpretation of that answer. Um, and it is in a litigation setting, the decision to perform a calculation cannot be used as a safe harbor, allowing a member to ignore relevant information and professional judgment. Moreover, a member is required by the standards to obtain sufficient relevant data to afford a reasonable basis for conclusions, recommendations, or positions consider scope limitations which affect the level of reliance of information and exercise due professional care and the performance of services, including completing sufficient research and obtaining adequate documentation. So I think kind of the general gist of this one is you're still applying professional judgment when you're making the initial agreement um, with your client for the agreed upon procedures. So you really shouldn't be agreeing to something with them that is going to get you in trouble on any of these things interpretation. So, you know, you wanna make sure that the agreed upon procedures, you're still applying your professional judgment, that you're gonna have sufficient relevant data, um, you're not gonna have scope limitations, and that you're still exercising due professional care. So just because you're agreeing to the approaches, basically it's not getting you out from under any of our standards for performing evaluation. Next slide, please. Okay, so the next one is related to scope of work in a review engagement. 
And again, I just want to kind of level set on the review engagement side. Um, business valuation review is the act or process of developing and communicating a member's opinion regarding the credibility of the work product of another valuation analyst. So review engagement, we're reviewing evaluation that somebody else has performed as opposed to starting from scratch on your own valuation. So this question is, in a review engagement, should a member opine as to scope of work as defined in the report under review? The answer is, consistent with the scope of work as defined in the report under review, the member is required to develop an opinion as to the completeness, accuracy, adequacy, relevance and reasonableness of the report given law regulations or intended user requirements applicable to that scope of work. Um, next slide. So basically what that answer is saying is you're reviewing the engagement based on the scope of work listed in the engagement. Um, and there's nothing specific in the standard that says specifically you should be looking at scope of work. There's no like line item checklist that says scope of work is something that must be reviewed. But as part of the interpretation, what we're saying is, although it's not part of a review engagement to opine, to opine as to the appropriateness of the scope of work, a member should determine if the report is reliable in accordance with review standards. So the general review is, did this person provide a reliable valuation report? Do I think it's reasonable to, for other people to rely on it? Am I going to offer an opinion that this valuation report is reliable? Um, and part of that determination needs to be looking at the scope of work. And again, this will kind of go back to my prior answer. You kind of have to consider, did the scope of work cover all of the things that were kind of required to look at? Did they use professional judgment or their scope limitations based on that scope of work? Um, do they have sufficient relevant data? And do they exercise due professional care? So it's not a specific line item, but it is wrapped up kind of in the reliability, um, reliability of the overall valuation. Those are the only two questions I have specifically listed in here, but I wanted to quickly circle back to another one that I know um, I think maybe at the end of last year was covered uh, in around the valuation world, but I have seen a couple new um, like automated valuation calculators come out recently. They've been coming across my email. The standards board has kind of talked about them. And I just want to circle back so everybody's aware just since I've seen them come out more recently um, that there is a frequently asked question out there about does the output of an automated valuation model represent a conclusion of value or an opinion of a calculated value that can be proffered in a litigation setting? And the answer is no. The output of an automated valuation model is not in and of itself representative of an opinion of a conclusion of value or calculated value suitable for a litigation setting. And again, it kind of comes down to professional judgment. Um, it depends on what you're putting into the model and what you're getting out and it, are the inputs um, rising to the level of professional judgment. So I know that one's not on here and that's not kind of the whole thing, but it's in that link that's provided at the beginning of this presentation. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because I feel like with COVID, for some reason, a lot more of these automated valuation models are coming out. So. Just for your reference, that's where you can find that. And that's all that I have.